All right, our last section of chapter 13 on the peripheral nervous system, we looked at the cranial nerves. Now let's look at the spinal nerves and peripheral nerves, as well as a quick review of peripheral motor nerve endings. <clears throat> <coughs> there are 31 pairs of, of spinal nerves emerging from the vertebral column, from the spinal cord. And here we are in cartoon representation. You can see that groups of spinal nerves form these crisscrossing plexi, or individual plexus, where they share and, and swap fibers, which ultimately give rise to peripheral nerves. And so we'll be taking a look at uh, some notable uh, peripheral nerves that emerge from each of these plexi here, 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 and here. The spinal nerves uh, comprise ventral roots and dorsal roots. The ventral roots have motor neurons, and the dorsal roots have sensory neurons, unipolar sensory neurons. <clears throat> and, then and then they combine together to form the spinal nerve, which emerges from the intervertebral foramen between each pair of vertebral bones. So here we see a cartoon drawing a little bit sort of, I don't know, <laughs> stretched um, of, the, of the vertebral body right here. And we can see a spinal nerve right here. It's comprised of the dorsal root, which is sensory neurons, and unipolar, unipolar sensory nerve bodies form this dorsal root ganglion, a place where cell bodies are in the peripheral nervous system. And the ventral root is all made up of motor neurons, uh, somatic motor neurons that arise in the uh, ventral horn of the gray matter, and also some sympathetic neurons that arise in the lateral horn. <clears throat> as soon as those, ner those, those spinal nerves emerge from the intervertebral foramen, they branch to form the dorsal ramus or branch and the ventral ramus. Let's take a look at those. So here's the dorsal ramus of the spinal nerve, which will innervate the structures of the back and the surface of the body and the posterior. And here's the ventral ramus, which will innervate the body, all the rest of the structures at this level, uh, anterior and again. <clears throat> we will come back to these ramus communicants when we talk about chapter 14, the autonomic nervous system. So that's what uh, autonomic neurons are found in these small branches <clears throat> right here that give rise to the sympathetic ganglia of the autonomic nervous system. So <clears throat> nerve plexi arise from the ventral rami of most of the spinal nerves. This region, T2 T through T12, there's no plexus, but in the, uh, in the neck, shoulders, and uh, lumbar region, sacral region, uh, Within each plexus, as I said, the, the fibers from the various spinal nerves crisscross to form, eventually form the peripheral nerves. The idea is to sort of maybe prevent the damage to one uh, um, <coughs> peripheral nerve uh, just completely debilitating the entire limb, for example. Here's another diagram showing that spinal nerve forming from a dorsal ramus of unipolar sensory neurons, ventral ramus of motor neurons, Forming the spinal nerve and then a branching to form the dorsal ramus and the ventral ramus of the spinal nerve. <clears throat> All right, let's take a look at the plexi. The cervical plexus, the most superior plexus, is made up of some of the spinal nerves in the neck. And I've just picked out the phrenic nerve for us to pay attention to from that plexus. The phrenic nerve, here we can see it emerging from the cervical plexus. This crisscrossing and swapping of fibers, and the gray represents some uh, other nerves, some peripheral nerves that are forming. And <clears throat> the, the phrenic nerve goes on to, uh, to innervate the diaphragm muscle, the muscle for breathing, resting breathing. The brachial plexus gives rise to nerves that innervate the arm, hence the term brachial, which means of the arm. Here's the the brachial plexus, which is arises again, arises from cervical spinal nerves in this one thoracic spinal nerve. You know, after the uh, crisscrossing completes, we have some discrete peripheral nerves that we'll take a look at. I'll start. All right. <clears throat> Here are the nerves that I picked out. Uh, you'll be familiar with from lab from the brachial plexus. The musculocutaneous nerve innervates the forearm flexors in the anterior upper arm, the 
biceps brachii and the brachialis, and the skin of the lateral and anterior parts of the arm and forearm. The radial nerve, the lateral most nerve, innervates the triceps muscle, as well as the extensor muscles in the lateral part of the forearm, <clears throat> as well as the posterior and lateral uh, skin surface of the, of the arm, and the lateral two-thirds of the hand on the posterior. The ulnar nerve innervates flexor muscles in the hand and the medial surface of the arm and the forearm, as well as the anterior and posterior one-third of the hand and digits. And the median nerve innervates flexor muscles as well as the um, <clears throat> as well as the skin of the anterior lateral two-thirds of the forearm and, and, and hand. There's a picture showing it. The best way to practice studying these, the function of these nerves is to look at the compartment or the location of the nerve within the arm and just remember the muscles that you know to be in that area. And those will be, in fact, the muscles innervated by the nerve as it passes through. And also look uh, at the skin closest to this nerve as it, as it nears the surface, and that will be the, the sensory function of that nerve uh, almost certainly. So it's a quick look at this diagram will help you uh, teach yourself those, those uh, functions of, of the, bra the brachial, uh, or the peripheral nerves of the brachial plexus. Carpal tunnel syndrome, well, you can see these, these um, brachial nerve, these peripheral nerves of the brachial plexus pass through the, the carpal tunnel on the anterior surface of the, of the wrist. And it's a narrow space through which all the flexor tendons pass. And if there's inflammation due to disease or overuse, uh, um, the, the tendons will begin to swell and compress the nerves as they pass through the carpal tunnel, re resulting in pain and weakness. That's called carpal tunnel syndrome, as I'm sure you've heard. Well, anti-inflammatory drugs and splints can often be used to allow the inflammation to settle down by preventing uh, use of the, of the tendons for a period of time to alleviate the pain and eventually go back to a normal activities. If, if the, in a severe case, it might be necessary to perform surgery to cut a connective tissue band that wraps around the carpal tunnel and entraps uh, those, those tendons and nerves in that, in that, in that finite, narrow region. <clears throat> the lumbar plexus. From the lumbar plexus, I picked out the femoral nerve to talk about. It innervates the quadriceps muscles. We'll see in a second in the cartoon drawing. It, it travels anteriorly through the upper leg, the thigh, innervates the quadriceps group of muscles in the skin of the anterior thigh and the medial surface of the leg. And here we see this enormous uh, trunk here, the femoral nerve, and it will innervate these medial parts of the leg as well as the the quadriceps group of muscles. Let's go now to the sacral plexus. The sacral plexus, I chose the gluteal nerves, which innervate the gluteal muscles. The gluteal group is an enormous group of muscles that we talked about in lab, and we should have some notion of what nerves innervate them. Uh, the cartoons, incidentally, the, the um, videos of muscle function from our laboratory on Muscle Origins, Assertions, and Actions uh, refers you to the nerves which innervate the muscles, so that'll give you a chance to, if you want to look back at those, at those videos, it'll help you refresh on, this, on the muscles, and it'll also um, inform you about the nerves that innervate the muscles. The sciatic nerve, the largest nerve in your body, <coughs> is actually comprised of the tibial nerve and the common fibular nerve. It passes in the posterior and innervates the hamstring muscles, some adductor muscles, as well as the muscles of the posterior lower leg, the gastrocnemius, the soleus, the plantar flexion muscles, as well as the digit flexor flexors that lie deep to the soleus. It provides sensation from the posterior leg as well as the plantar surface. Let's take a look at that. Uh, cartoon. Here's the sacral plexus giving rise to this enormous trunk called the sciatic nerve. And the sciatic nerve splits to form the tibial nerve. And the tibial nerve innervates those posterior mu muscles of the posterior lower leg and the plantar surface. 
as well as the hamstring muscles. And the common fibular nerve innervates the fibularis longus and brevis here, and uh, the tibialis anterior muscle, as well as the lateral uh, sensation from the lateral parts of the lower leg. Okay, so that's our story as far as the peripheral nerves, uh, spinal nerves and peripheral nerves. Dermatomes is a quick look at an interesting concept. A dermatome is a region of the skin surface innervated by particular the nerves that emanate from a particular spinal nerve. And it's drawn into a map in the next picture. And dermatomes are useful uh, for diagnosing nervous system injury by testing to see where sensory function may have been lost. <clears throat> so you can see that each of the spinal nerves is marked in a funny outlined pattern that looks kind of like a paint by number uh, kit. And it, what it represents is the surface of the body is innervated by nerves that come from the spinal nerve number there in the diagram. So if there's spinal cord injury or peripheral nerve injury or spinal nerve injury, you can uh, make some assessments based on um, patient responses to find out where the function exists and is absent and to make some diagnoses. So it's a pretty cool thing, the idea of dermatomes. <clears throat> Hilton's Law is uh, a, a simple statement that says that a nerve serving a muscle that produces movement at a particular joint also innervates the joint and the skin over the joint. So we said the proprioceptors are going to be present at that joint, somatic sensors and, and somatic sensing, sensation in the skin over the joint. Um, so again, as I was, it's basically what I was saying before, if you look and see where a nerve travels, you can see where um, <coughs> where it innervates. And, and the, the, the structures in the region will be the structures that innervates here. We're just also saying that if you know it innervates a particular muscle, then you know it innervates that joint on it if the muscle moves. All right, just a quick review of peripheral motor endings, something we've already looked at before, so we don't need to spend a lot of time on it. The um, somatic motor division includes the neuromuscular junctions. That's the type of, of terminals we're talking about. And here we see a, a, a sort of composite diagram of a whole bunch of, of pictures associated with the neuromuscular junction. Let's break it up and, and take a look. Here's a motor neuron, a somatic motor neuron, whose axon branch is then attached to the skeletal muscle, forming the neuromuscular junctions, the motor end plate here, where the neuromuscular junctions form uh, this connection on the skeletal muscle membrane. Um, <clears throat> when, it, when an impulse travels down the axon of this somatic motor neuron, it reaches the terminal, electrogenic calcium channels open, and calcium enters into the cytoplasm from outside, right? In a resting cell, there's no calcium in the cytoplasm. It's stored in organelles. In this case, it's uh, there's channels to let it in from outside. Once that happens, neurotransmitter vesicles are exocytose releasing acetylcholine into the neuromuscular junction, the synaptic cleft, which then binds to its receptors, which are channels, which are sodium potassium channels. Right? The acetylcholine receptor is a sodium potassium channel, and the net effect when opened is that more sodium enters and the net effect is depolarizing the membrane. The membrane has a negative charge or potential at rest. And when we open up this uh, acetylcholine receptor channel, sodium ions rush in and make the interior less negative, depolarize it. When we want to terminate a contraction, we simply stop sending impulses down the motor neuron, stop releasing acetylcholine, and what happens to the existing acetylcholine? It's very quickly degraded by an enzyme that's always active in the synapse of the synaptic cleft, acetylcholine esterase, so we can terminate that contraction. <clears throat> the autonomic nervous system has motor endings as well. And again, this is sort of sneaking over into the area of the autonomic nervous system, but we already mentioned these motor endings when we talked about smooth muscle in chapter 9. So let's quickly review um, the autonomic motor endings. Here's a picture of an autonomic motor neuron, which is going to activate these smooth muscle cells, this sheet or layer of smooth muscle cells in some hollow organ, probably the digestive tract. And there's just varicosities, enlargements of the axon where there's um, collections of uh, um, neurotransmitter-containing vesicles. And when we activate this 
uh, motor neuron. Neurotransmitters is spewed out in the region of, of this sheet of muscle cells, and it eventually will diffuse over and bind to receptors on the, in the muscle cells. It's called a diffuse junction for that reason. Instead of a discrete connection like the neuromuscular junction of the somatic motor division, we have these diffuse junctions of the autonomic nervous system. Join me now for, for chapter 5 as we complete our discussion of, of chapter 13 in the peripheral nervous system.